Good evening, everybody. Good evening, and thank you for coming out on this uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful fall evening. Actually, today was actually very nice, wasn't it? So we got a little bit of a reprieve today, and uh, here's the VIP section. No, absolutely. God bless you, folks. Really, I'm so grateful for you all to be able to come out this evening with us. You know, um, we have an incredible parish here at St. Dominic's. For those of you who are visiting here, you're not visitors, you're not guests, you're home. Anytime there's a tabernacle nearby, we know this is God's home. We are his sons and daughters. We're home. And tonight is a very special time for us to learn even more about the traditions, the beauty that belongs to you and me, the treasures of our church. And we decided to do these series, the next three evenings that we'll have together on each Tuesday, um, to go deeper into the beauties of our tradition that we know are there, uh, that need to be shared, un unraveled, and you know, these are ours. These, these belong to us. So with that, I want to introduce this evening's first speaker of this three series uh, that we will enjoy uh, together ahead. And this man is someone I met many years ago, and I have to share with you briefly a little bit of a story of how I came to meet Mr. Uh, Peter. Carter, a very dear friend of mine and someone who I, over the years, have went from working with to looking up to in all that he has done uh, for music and for the beauty and glory of the church. I began a little over eight years uh, at Bishop's invitation to start up the uh, Usus Antiqui, or the ancient use of the Mass, in light of what our Pope Emeritus, Pope Benedict, had asked for, uh, that we come to understand the beauties of the tradition of our church, and so Bishop had invited me to head this up. And afterwards, I said, thank you, Bishop. This is going to be wonderful. And as soon as I said yes, I said, uh-oh, now what? <laughs> you know, where are my resources? I have none. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I got to work with some wonderful people. Dorothy Conway, who is here this evening, she'll also be a presenter of ours in our third and final series uh, that I believe will be very, very helpful for us as well, for especially those of us in the pew. And she'll speak to that on the third night. Uh, but... All of a sudden, I find myself realizing music. Hmm, well, I mean, I can sing you Johnny Cash or an Irish tune. You, oh, give me a guitar. But, wow, traditional Latin mass. Where am I going to find it? And as God always does, God provides. Because this man came out of a cloud and said, Hey, hi, I heard you're doing this. What? Who are you? What? I'm Peter. I'm a student over at Westminster Choir College. I hear you're starting this. I go, You got the job. <laughs> <laughs> and from that day to now, I cannot believe what this young man has accomplished. Um, not only will you come to know just how much this man truly knows and his passion and what he has involved himself into the traditional mass and, and for all of what we'll hear about tonight, but he's, he's, he's jet-setting around the world meeting the best organists, the best musicians of our time. Really, I mean, unbelievable. He just interviewed a cardinal for crying out loud. Cardinal Sarah, who is an amazing man, who has just published an incredible book, and I, I'm not, I should get a commission. I should sell his books over here. And he's interviewing this guy. I can't even get an audience with him, and he's having uh, you know, these uh, fireside chats with him. And so without further ado, I'll let Peter certainly speak for himself, a man who I uh, really look up to and admire, and I'm so happy that he can be here with us today. Because you know what, folks? Two or three years, I don't know if we're going to be able to afford them. Peter Carter. Thank you very much, Father. It is a real uh, privilege and an honor to be here tonight. Thank you so much for the invitation, Father. Father Woodrow is uh, someone I've worked with for nearly seven years. Um, it's been, it was a great privilege of my life. I learned so much from working with him. Um, I am continuing as the music director at St. John the Baptist in Allentown uh, under Father Michael Wallach now, and it is such a, an honor to be here tonight, so thank you, Father. Um, for this evening, this will be a, a walkthrough of all of the music of the Latin Mass, particularly in preparation for the Mass in two weeks, um, under, or in a few weeks on December 9th. Uh, for the Immaculate Conception. So on your, um, 
I have a handout of the musical structure of the Mass, which should be on your tables, which you can reference throughout the presentation tonight. Um, but I'd like to begin with how the Mass will begin um, on December 9th, which will be with a hymn, Immaculate Mary. So we're just, we'll sing one verse together. We'll just, uh, here we go. Immaculate Mary, all praises we sing. You reign now in splendor with Jesus our King. Ave, Ave, Ave Maria. Before we dive into the structure of the Mass, we'll, I wanted to delve into a few questions of why we sing the Mass and, and why is music so important for the celebration of the Mass. Instead of telling you why I think it's important, I'm going to be quoting uh, a few documents of the Church, who can, which can uh, say it much more succinctly than, than myself. Um, the first question, why sing the Mass? I'll, I'll read this for all of you in the back in case you can't see it. Liturgical worship is given a more noble form when the divine offices are celebrated solemnly in song with the assistance of sacred ministers and the active participation of the people. So this is from, from Vatican II, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. This is the theological reason of why we sing the Mass. There's a lot of other reasons as well, historical reasons. Um, one interesting historical fact, which people may not be aware of, is that having the Mass just spoken instead of sung is actually historically an exception to the rule. If you were to go to the Jewish temple before the time of Christ and to witness one of those services, you would have the choir of Levites singing the whole service. And in the time of Christian worship, the tradition was continued with, from the Jewish temple that there was the development of what is called the Schola Cantorum, which was really the Christian continuation of the choir of Levites. And the role of singing the liturgy never stopped. And having, having a mass spoken without music was a later adjustment for pastoral reasons, for places for when you couldn't have sung liturgies all the time. But that was the norm. And if you go to the East now, to any Orthodox services, there's always music as well. Um, they, they never made adaptations how we did in the West of having spoken masses in the way that, uh, that we do here, usually often for daily masses. But also in the East now, they don't really they don't often have daily masses. There's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more work of, of various members um, to sing the mass, and we'll go into that in just a moment with looking at the various musical roles of the mass. So the next question I have: Should we always prefer sung masses to spoken masses? And the church tells us yes. For the celebration of the Eucharist with the people, especially on Sundays and feast days, a form of sung mass, misa in cantu, is to be preferred as much as possible, even several times on the same day. How do people actively participate in the mass? This is a really important question because there's been so much talk about participating in the Mass through movement, through action, through music, through prayer, how are we supposed to pray the Mass? In the 1967 Instruction on Sacred Music, the Church says, this is a little bit long, but it's important. The faithful fulfill their liturgical role by making that full, conscious, and active participation 
which is demanded by the nature of the liturgy itself, and which is, by reason of baptism, the right and duty of the Christian people. This participation should, above all, be internal, in the sense that by it the faithful join their mind to what they pronounce or hear and cooperate with heavenly grace. It must be, on the other hand, external also, that is, such to show the internal participation by gestures and bodily attitudes, by the acclamations, responses, and singing. The faithful should also be taught to unite themselves interiorly to what the ministers or choir sing, so that by listening to them they may raise their minds to God. I just want to point out here, it's referencing uh, participating by, by movements and singing, the way we kneel and stand for different parts of the Mass, and the way that we sing different parts of the Mass, such as the Gloria. And then it also references parts that are sung by ministers and the choir. Um, throughout this presentation, I'll refer to the choir in its historical term, which is the Scola Cantorum. Um, sometimes it's, it's pretty much used interchangeably in the documents of the church in referring to, to the choir. Um, but I just want to use the, the historical term uh, throughout this so you can uh, become more familiar with it. Who sings the Mass? There's three main roles in singing the Mass. We have the people up front who we see, the ministers, particularly in a solemn high Mass in the extraordinary form, we have three main ministers, the priest, the deacon, and the subdeacon, very clearly figuring the Trinity. And so uh, there's who we see up front, the scola cantorum or the choir, oftentimes are in the back in the choir loft like we'll have here at St. Dominic's. And they have certain songs that, are, that we're supposed to listen to. We're not supposed to sing what the ministers sing, we don't sing the gospel, or we don't sing the parts that the priest sings. We listen to that and we respond to the responses. And there's songs that the Scola Contorum sings that we listen to and have to, to meditate on their texts. And then there's also the congregation, what we all sing together, the laity, the, and when the congregation sings, it's not just the people in the pews as well, it can be the, the choir can join them and, and, and help lead them, and then uh, anyone in the sanctuary as well can sing along. All right, so three main divisions of the music of the Mass. This is where it gets slightly complicated, um, particularly if you're not familiar with the, the uh, an extraordinary form of the Mass, or the traditional Latin Mass. Yes, is there a question? Oh, yes. Great. All right. So, who sings what? In the Latin Mass, everything is sung. Everything that you hear is sung, which can be a little bit of a different experience in that um, oftentimes, say, in the ordinary form, if we have music at Mass, there's parts that are there's still spoken responses back and forth. But in what we were looking at earlier, the church says the highest form is for the whole Mass to be sung. And so in the celebration of the traditional Latin Mass, everything is really sung from the beginning to the end. Um, and here, uh, let's look first at the congregation. The congregation has sings the ordinary and the dialogues with the priests. Um, the dialogues are when the priest sings, the Lord be with you, and we all sing back, and with your spirit. But it's in Latin, so it's Dominus vobis cum, And then he'll say the collect, or the post-communion, or some other prayer. Um, the first thing that we sing in the Mass is the Kyrie, the Lord have mercy followed by the Gloria, the ancient hymn of praise, the Credo, our proclamation of belief, the Sanctus, the hymn of the angels, and the Agnus Dei, which we sing in preparation for Holy Communion. What we're probably not as familiar with are the parts of the Mass that are sung by the choir, 
Schola Cantorum, and these are called the propers. The propers are five parts, just like the ordinary. The, all of this is called the ordinary, the curia, gloria, etc. But the propers we're probably not as familiar with. They can be sung in the ordinary form and are in many places, particularly in papal masses. Uh, the Sistine Chapel Choir will, will sing these parts of the mass. But oftentimes in, in the average parish, they're not sung as often for various reasons, which we we'll probably won't be able to get into tonight. But they are, they are parts of the mass, intrinsic parts of the mass, that the text is in the missal of the mass. The introit is the first, the first chant or song uh, that is sung in procession into the church. And oftentimes it's not sung quite, say, processing from the back. It can be just when the priest processes to the altar as he's praying some, the, the prayers at the foot of the altar in, in silence. So the first prayer of the Mass, many people aren't aware of this, but in the Latin Mass, the first prayer of the Mass, beginning the Mass, is actually sung by the choir. And... Um, the gradual, that's where we're most familiar with the, in the Novus Ordo Mass, the responsorial psalm. The gradual is, uh, is uh, a text in the Latin Mass, oftentimes it's, it's just a verse, it's oftentimes just two verses of a psalm. And that's the opportunity for us to, to meditate on, on the Mass and on the scripture that is being, that is being sung. The Alleluia, which we're familiar with. The offertory, um, which is a specific, specific text to be sung during the, the preparation of, of gifts for the Mass and the offertory prayers, and then a specific chant to be sung during the distribution of communion. Also, for the, for the, the ministers, the, the readings are all sung, just, which are just two, the Epistle and the Gospel. And then the other uh, orations, the collect, post-communion, and the preface is sung right before the Sanctus. So the next, the next uh, slide will be your handout that you have on your table, which is the musical structure of the Mass. All of those things in the order in which they appear during the Mass. There's a lot of different moving parts. Oops. So... This is one of the things I think that takes a little while for people who aren't used to attending the Latin Mass is, wait, which part's happening right now, <laughs> right? Because there's a lot going on, and wait, the, the, I hear the choir singing something, and the priest is doing something else, and then the therapist is over here, and you know, so what's, what's quite happening? And part of that is intentional in the design of the Mass, that and it's in, this is important why, to understand why the, the choir has its own liturgical role uh, to, that they're performing. So when they're singing the introit for the Mass, and the, 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 the priests are up in the sanctuary whispering to themselves, and you see people striking their breasts, and you're like, wait, wait, what, what should I be doing? The choir's not doing that. And so noticing the, the, the prayers at the foot of the altar are what the priest prays, Psalm 42, in preparation uh, as, he's, as he's about to say the Mass, as he ascends the altar. And then he goes up, reads the introit, and then incenses the altar as well, and while the choir is singing the introit. The first time we hear the priest do anything in Mass is a little, bit, a little while. Um, he intones the Gloria. So the choir, the choir is doing their own thing and leading the, the, the liturgical ceremony. The, the priest sings, Gloria in excelsis Deo. And then everyone continues the hymn of praise and sings along. And then he gets his, his first, first prayer is the collect afterwards. So uh, just to... Uh, we're going to move on, but just to, to keep this kind of image in mind, this is why I wanted to, to print it out. 
for you to follow along and reference as we're going to go through kind of each part of, of the Mass. Um, so, um, the, the first text, I just want to, to, to point this out, because the introit, the introit's very ancient, and it's part of the Mass that many people are not familiar with. Um, as soon as there had been the ceremony of an, of an entrance into the church, which was in the fourth century, when Christianity could be practiced legally, they didn't have to, to hide in the catacombs and, and pray their, their masses in private, but when they could first go outside and walk in the square, walk into the church publicly without being arrested, then music accompanied this action. And that was the introit, which developed at this time. So ever since then, in the fourth century, we've had this musical accompaniment to the procession. Um, and the text for the introit for the Immaculate Conception is here. The choir is, of course, singing in Latin for the Latin Mass. I will heartily rejoice in the Lord, and my God is the joy of my soul, for he has clothed me with a robe of salvation and wrapped me in a mantle of justice, like a bride bedecked with her jewels. I will extol you, O Lord, for you drew me clear and did not let my enemies rejoice over me. So, this is from the Psalms and from Isaiah. Um, looking at the proper is, is, is really beautiful and important because there are oftentimes parts of Scripture that can be overlooked that are in, they're part of the Mass, but if we don't sing them, particularly in the ordinary form of the Mass, then we're, we're missing out on having the scripture proclaimed at Mass. I mean, we have the readings, which is important and beautiful, but there's other parts that, to the Mass as well. Um, it's a little bit ironic in some ways that, say, in, uh, in the, the Novus Ordo Mass, there, there's a greater, there's a three-year lectionary, so there, there's a greater uh, option of readings and selection of readings throughout the years. But oftentimes, as we've experienced in the celebration of the Novus Ordo Mass, there's, these texts aren't sung as well at the same time, but they, they can be. But it's important to, to, to use all of the, the rich traditions of the church to bring the most solemnity, the most beauty, and this is what the church's tradition provides. Now, you might be thinking, well, I've maybe never have heard this or never was aware of it. Um, where, where's this coming from? Where, where do we, if, if I led the music or tried to sing this at Mass, what would I reference? You know, this isn't what I normally see. Um, and the church thought of that. There is an official liturgical music book called the Graduale Romanum. And this is the official liturgical music book for the traditional Latin Mass, but also for the Novus Ordo, for the ordinary form of the Mass as well. Why you've probably not heard it as much in the, in the ordinary form is that this is for the ordinary form, but it's in Latin. So if people want to sing some of these texts in English, there are adaptations for that as well. They're not as popular, they are getting uh, becoming more popular as well. But, but the official liturgical book is in Latin. And this is what the introit, the text we just looked at, this is what it would look like in that book for, for the Mass in, in a couple weeks. Gaudens et Gaudebo. So this is what the choir is looking at when they're singing. I'll just demonstrate just for a moment so you can see how this uh, how this sounds? Gardens, gardebo, in domino. So the chant notation. You might be thinking, wait, I don't know. Might not be familiar with this. Is this new? Is this different? Or why is this different? And oftentimes it's more of a, uh, an enigma than it needs to be. The chant notation was just the musical notation that was the original mu music notation. You can see in some ways it's a little bit more primitive 
there's four lines instead of five is a modern notation that we might be used to. And some things are just different. Instead of circles, we have squares. It's just, um, so it's, it's very similar in a lot of ways. When there's two notes like this, one on top of the other, we sing the bottom note first. Um, but by and large, I mean, when it goes up, our voice goes up. When the, the line descends, our voice descends as well, and it moves in the same, in the same way. So, in the process of the mass, the introit is the, is the first thing sung. And then, the curie is congregational. And what I'd like to do is, since we'll all be, or hopefully most of us will be here in a, in a few weeks for the mass, I'd like to sing the curie tonight, so you can have a little bit of preparation for it. Um, so, I'll sing it first, and then you can sing it back. Your turn. This right here means we do it three times. So um, the next part we'll do three times as well. So three times Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. Three times Christe eleison, Christ have mercy. And three times Kyrie. This is two times this one. And then the last one is slightly different. So let's sing the Christe. I'll sing it first. Christe. Again, that one's three times, and then we have twice of the next Kyrie. slightly different. We just repeat the first part again like this. And then it goes on just as before. Etc. Can we do this one together? And. to the middle of the altar, you hear on the organ, do 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 Gloria in excelsis Deo. And then we all sing, et in terra pax omnibus, bone voluntatis, laudamus te, benedicimus. Oh, 
Subdeacon gets up to chant the epistle. We all sit down. After the chanting of the epistle, it's the choir's turn. Or oftentimes, say in the in the ordinary form, it would be the cantor if they're leading the responsorial psalm. The 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 choir will sing uh, the gradual, which the text for the gradual for the Immaculate Conception. Blessed are you, O Virgin Mary, by the Lord. The Most High, God, above all women upon the earth, you are the glory of Jerusalem, you are the joy of Israel, you are the honor of our people. And then immediately following the gradual, the Alleluia is sung, you are all beautiful, O Mary, and there is no stain of original sin in you. Alleluia. As soon as the gospel is done, as soon as the Alleluia is done, the gospel begins Again, with a, with a response for back and forth, Dominus Vobiscum, etc. After the Gospel, there's usually the homily, as we all know. Um, and then after the homily, the, the creed, the credo, in a sung mass, even the, the long statement of faith, even that in the history of the Church's musical tradition has been sung. Um, I think for the sake of time tonight, we won't sing it all this evening, but, um, but I have it here for you. And the Mass we're singing, the, the Kyrie Gloria, and then we'll go through the Sanctus and Agnus Dei as well, is titled Misa de Angelis, which is the Latin term, or Mass of the Angels in, in English. And it's, I know it's in the St. Michael hymnal, which is here at the parish, um, and is available online as well for free. After the, the creed is sung, we have the offertory text um, sung by the Scola. Hail full of Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Alleluia. Um, the preface, so this is all of the, the offertory prayers are sung uh, silently by the priest, said silently by the priest during this time. Um, and oftentimes there can be another hymn or motet or something after the offertory antiphon is sung. Uh, the preface dialogue 
uh, is, is the next thing that, that, uh, that happens between the priest and the congregation. Dominus vobis cum, et cum spiritu tuo, sursum corda. And the text for this is, Abemus ad Dominum, lift up your hearts, we have lifted them up to the Lord. Abemus ad Dominum. Great. And... So the preface is the long chant uh, sung by the priest, next, and we all respond to, to uh, his singing with singing um, the, the hymn of the angels, the Sanctus. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. the consecration in silence that it's beautiful in this moment in the mass the we've had music up until the most important part of the mass the part where we have the mystery of, of the, the crucifixion we're about to witness before our eyes and this moment the the consecration and the offering of of Christ uh, in uh, the, through the prayers uh, of the consecration is is in silence, and this is important because the the silence serves as even an extra veil that everything is, is drawn in. Every everything um, up until this point with the music, it has a sensory aspect. With you, you can listen and follow. You can hear what's happening, but when you're deprived of that that assistance, then Everything is hushed, and your attention is hyper-focused, and the priest is praying silently. And this is the invitation to unite ourselves spiritually with the sacrifice of the Mass, that this is the most important thing happening, and so we're supposed to draw all of our attention and concentration towards uniting ourselves with the sacrifice. So it's important to be aware of that, that the, the, the silence at the consecration is really intentional, and to kind of embrace that. The next, um, the next thing we sing is the Agnus Dei. There's a few more uh, responsories, Dominus Obiscum, etc., by the priest, but the Agnus Dei is the most uh, notable song thing next. Um, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Agnus Dei Quitolis peccata mundi miserere nobis agnus Oh. 
And then we have the invitation to receive Holy Communion, during which the Communion Antiphon is like the introit at the procession of the priest at the beginning of the Mass. The Communion Antiphon is, accompanies the procession of the faithful. Specific text as, as we're uh, going forward, forward to, the, to the altar rail to receive. <coughs> Glorious things are said of you, O Mary, for he who is mighty has done great things for you. Oftentimes as well, it's not for the case in, in uh, this Mass, but I mean, in, in a way it is, because the Gospel references, references Mary. But oftentimes the communion antiphon is a verse or two taken from the Gospel, hearkening the invitation to meditate on the Gospel as we're receiving communion as well. I'm just going to run through the end of the Mass. After we receive Holy Communion, the priest has an oration, the post-communion, May the sacrament we have received, O Lord our God, heal in us the wounds of that sin, from which by a singular privilege you kept immaculate the conception of Blessed Mary. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, thy Son, our, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. And then to conclude the Mass, we have the Ite Misa Est. For the sake of this slide, you can disregard Benedict Commerce Domino will respond, Deo gratias. So the priest, it's the same melody as the Kyrie that we sang earlier. He sings, or this is the deacon, sorry. point, liturgically speaking. They still process out, and there's still a hymn sung, but the parts, the liturgical parts of the Mass have concluded. The, the last gospel is, is, uh, is prayed, and that is, liturgically speaking, that's a, that's a prayer of thanksgiving for the Mass. The mass, is, the mass is completed at this point. So, musically speaking, probably the biggest difference from the presentation I just gave, and maybe the common experience uh, many of us have, the question you might be thinking is, where are the hymns? Where do they fit into this? Because all the music I went through didn't really have hymns. So, it's an important question. Um, I won't go into to necessarily why, why we have such a strong hymn culture, which is not necessarily uh, which there's a lot of great things from hymns, but um, what the distinction I want to make here and is between music that is intrinsic to the liturgical rite and music that is extrinsic, music that is necessary for mass to be celebrated, and music that is helpful, beautiful, but extra. It's not necessary. It's not required. The texts that we just all went through, all the parts of the ordinary, all the parts of the priests, all of the parts of the choir, if you're having a, a, a sung mass celebrated in the traditional form, all of that has to be sung. Can you have more music besides that? Can you have hymns? Yes. And uh, we oftentimes do. I know at the Immaculate Conception Mass coming up, there will be two hymns as well. There'd be Immaculate Mary at the beginning and Hail Holy Queen at the end. So uh, they work hand in hand, but it's important to understand this distinction of music that is intrinsic and necessary. So the, the term that can be used to, to understand this is that the liturgical music is music that is based on the liturgical texts. 
the Kyrie, Gloria, etc. What we all just what we're talking about. That is liturgical music intrinsic to the Mass. Devotional music is are say the, the many beautiful hymns, say the, the hymns written by say John Henry Newman, by many, many great um, hymnists over over the centuries. Or say even uh, some of the, the greatest composers to the church's tradition, writing motets for the choir to sing. That is isn't that music isn't strictly liturgical. It doesn't it isn't required. It's devotional. It helps us to pray. So the hymns and motets are devotional music, which can help us to pray at mass. This is important to keep in mind too. Just like the music of the organ, the we don't need to have any instruments in order to celebrate mass. If we're going to have a sung mass, we have to have singing, but we don't have to have the organ or any instruments. The church praises the organ as the most sacred of instruments, but it's not necessary for a song celebration of the Mass. So these go hand in hand, but it's important to understand the distinction uh, so we can, we can uh, think more critically about it. Just to conclude for this presentation, and then there will be time for questions and things afterwards, I would like to, for us to sing one verse of Hail Holy Queen, which will be what will conclude the Mass of the Immaculate Conception. Hail Holy Queen and throned above O Maria Hail Mother of mercy and of love O Maria And if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Yes. Hi, Peter. My name is Mary. I'm a post-Vatican baby. Mm -hmm. I've gone to church my entire life. I learned French in school. I work at an ESL school. I don't know Latin. I want to be a part of this, and I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone. How can you help me really appreciate this wonderful tradition as someone who doesn't know Latin. How can I be a part of this Latin Mass? That is a great question. Um, there, are, there are many approaches. I know some people say, you just need to drop the kid in the deep end, you know, and <laughs> they might not like swimming at first, but they'll, they'll learn that way. Uh, it might be a little bit scarred for a little while, but <laughs> no. So exactly, you you can learn that way, and a lot of people, some people do. They 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 just like you said, they're not. They they might not have experience with this form of the mass or with any bit of Latin, but they just dive right in. That's one approach, and that can be that can work for some people. What I would recommend, um, I don't know if you're you're, you're uh, have any musical focus at all, but I like to sing. <laughs> well, good, good, yeah. No, so so what I would recommend, I mean, the, the, this uh, handout. That's why I wanted to go through it. It's a little bit. It's complicated, right? There's a lot of parts to the mass, and I wouldn't say try to don't try to focus on all of them. Right? Focus on something that you can connect with. Particularly, you know, there's the parts in the Mass where every time the priest says Dominus Vobiscum, you say, Et cum spiritu tuo, right? So that's step one, right? And then trying to find the things that are most familiar. So, say there are two English hymns, all right? I can pray those hymns and I can sing that. I know that. All right, what are the next things? And so maybe that's why I wanted to go through a little bit of the music of the congregation. 
You don't, you, monks and, and saints have spent years, years of their lives writing about the aspects of the Mass and it's, how, how, how is this supposed to be understood? How is this supposed to be lived? How am I supposed to pray this part? There's many different ways to do things. We can't be frustrated that we can't comprehend or pray perfectly um, the, the, the sacrifice of the Mass. It's not intended for us to do that. What is intended is for us to unite ourselves to the prayer and to find something, some aspect particularly, that you can relate with, that you can learn, you can grasp. If you can learn the words Kyrie eleison, all right, and you can sing that, that one song, that's a great start, because that's the, the five parts that the, the, the congregation sings, that's, that's one, right? And then you can, I mean, the creed's the longest one, and maybe save that for last if you're gonna. <laughs> but, you know, trying to, um, to learn how we can love it. And the only way, we can't love that which we do not know. So, so taking it in bite-sized pieces, whether that's you know, trying to focus on what is most familiar, um, maybe focus on the strong similarities with the ordinary form of the Mass, the Novus Ordo, of, oh, this part I recognize, you know, say at the, the ordination um, at the cathedral, we sang, on you stay, quit all is that's the same thing, right? That's the exact same part of Mass. So trying to, to find little ways that you can latch on to and you can pray so that it feels less foreign and it can feel more, it can become part of yourself over time. Yeah. You said that the Lord was the most sacred instrument. What other instruments are allowed to be prayed during your Mass? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Uh, his question was, what other instruments besides the organ are allowed to be played during a Latin Mass? Um, I'll say this to preface it. The organ is the only instrument that the Church has praised as specifically suited for the celebration of the Sacred Liturgy. And this was in Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document of Vatican II. Oftentimes, say, in the history of the Church, particularly in the East, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, they still don't use instruments. They just sing the liturgy. Because there's a little bit of a theological tension at times that when we start to introduce things outside, we can, we can sometimes introduce something that is secular or not inherently sacred. And so that's, that's a, a, a tension that can be at, hard, at times hard to, uh, to find. In the Western tradition of the church, though, there was an embrace of musical instruments. Um, that music, music, uh, the, the playing of a musical instrument can be an expression of prayer for that person, which is important to recognize, which is the theological reason why recorded music is not permitted during the liturgy, because a recorded music is not a prayer, and any music and the liturgy is first and foremost an expression of prayer. So that's, recorded music is not allowed uh, in the liturgy at all. As far as, say, prohibitions on, on instruments, that is, um, that is, at times that, that has changed in regards to that's a pastoral judgment made by, uh, by the popes at different times. Pius X was more strict that kind of hearkening back to the importance of singing the text. And he allowed for the organ, but really not much else. Pius XII, for example, was a violinist, and he was a little bit more open to uh, having stringed instruments during Mass and that they could be used for uh, liturgical worship and not... The danger, again, always being that instrumental music can draw attention to itself rather than helping lead us to God. So in different cultural traditions, um, there have been different ways of having this expressed. I think the important thing, the unique thing about the organ is that the development of the instrument of the organ has always been historically united with, 
worship in the Christian tradition. Um, we, there was, people will say, oh, the organ existed in pagan times. Which is true to some degree. In ancient times, they had, uh, say, in the Colosseum, in different pagan services, they had an extremely primitive sort of organ. But the technological development of the instrument in the Middle Ages and after created it into a very, very much different instrument, um, still relying, say, on some of that basic technology. So the, the, the purpose of the organ, the way that it was created, what it was created for, was for the liturgy to help people to pray. The purpose of the electronic guitar, electric guitar, yeah, I've heard people play it at Mass. That wasn't intended for liturgical worship, right? Like, and so that's, that's pretty good. There, there's, there's different principles. Um, at times there's been different prohibitions on, on, say, this is for sure not, and then it's the discretion of, ultimately, of uh, the liturgist, which is the, the pastor of a particular parish, and then the bishop above him. So, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yes, my name is Nancy, and I'd just like to offer what you may find useful for Mary. You don't have to really know the Latin. I am a definitely free Vatican II. <laughs> my two children were about to receive First Communion when those uh, the Vatican II was implemented. That's how previous, and I had three years of Latin. You don't learn conversational Latin. It doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. So when you look at the words, you will eventually memorize them, and then if you resort to a missal or some other form that has the English, you will know what it says, even though you're singing it in Latin. So don't be afraid, because you don't know the language. Yeah, that's a great, great point, that... In the Mass, the ordinary that I was mentioning, those texts don't change week to week. Those are the same. So if we focus on learning those, we focus on a really stable part of the Mass that uh, we can grasp more quickly. The propers, the part that the scola sings, the choir, um, they change just like the readings because they're particular to the feasts. And so this is particularly where it's helpful to have a missal or a missal letter, the translations of what the Latin is if you would like to meditate on, on those texts. Um, but, say, focusing on the ordinary, the, the unchangeable parts of the Mass is probably the most beneficial way to start. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, do you know if there are going to be any, uh, for those who do not have Latin missals, will there be Latin missals? At, at yes, absolutely, yes. There will be... I'm sure at all the entrances and translations, there will be uh, missalettes for everyone to use. Yes, Dorothy. Hello, I'm Dorothy Conway, and I couldn't help but show you what will be at every entrance. Um, we've, these are the handheld, personal, beautiful Latin English book of missiles. So many people wanted to buy them that we now offer them for sale for a donation of $3. But they'll be available for your use at the Mass. We have hundreds of them. And they will be at every entrance for you to use. And just like Peter said, everything is in here with some additional prayers. They're actually very popular and beautiful. At every Latin Mass, we have it on St. John's. We have these at all the entrances. And they're also available if you'd like to take them home. So I'm sorry to interrupt, no. but no. Thank you. we try to provide everything that everybody could use. <coughs> Yes, good presentation. Thank you. Uh, why is uh, music not a part of the low mass, or is it? So that's a good question. The low mass developed in the monasteries. The first low mass is that, say, when you had the community of, of monks living together, they had a communal celebration of the mass, which was sung. That's what they all attended. But the low mass developed because then if say the individual monks, they're also priests and they went to celebrate his mass as well. It developed for practicality sake, that you couldn't have, say if 40 monks were living together, you couldn't have 40 sung masses a day on Sundays. So if they all wanted to celebrate a mass, or uh, they had to celebrate a mass, they, would, they, that's, they did it privately on the side altars um, and celebrated a mass 
spoken. Uh, so that's how the, the low mass developed. Um, as some of you may remember, um, the say if an attending low mass before uh, the development of the Novus Ordo, oftentimes there there were hymns sung during mass, and so low mass doesn't mean that there's no there's no music per se. It just means oftentimes the music is more devotional. There's hymns sung during low mass as opposed to the parts of the mass being sung like the, the Gloria and Creed and whatnot. Well, don't you think uh, these days in your average church service, you know, you don't have the entrance hymn, and then you have most of the, the prayers spoken, and then you'll have the, the, the offertory, you know, the, the hymn, uh, and then the communion. So it's kind of like a mixture. It, it's That's a great point. Mass, it's a, yeah. A no, and this is actually what I would argue is is um, a little bit of the, the important idea in the liturgical reform. The text, the documents I was quoting were from Vatican II and afterwards. And the idea is that we went to, they wanted to emphasize the sung liturgy because there were so many low masses and that that's not the ideal expression of liturgy. The ideal is to have a sung liturgy. So, say in the Novus Ordo, you're right, usually it's a mix. The daily mass is strictly... Like a low mass, right. Right. So in some ways, the say the typical typical mass on Sunday or average parish, they're singing the responsorial psalm and hallelujah. They're singing parts of the mass that say before the council you would just have a low mass. So there were no parts of the, the mass itself sung. So there are more parts of the mass sung in that regard, um, and the, there's hymns as well. So I think that's a step. And the full step is to have the ideal is to have all of the whole mass sung. You know. Yes. Um, I remember this as a child in the high school that I'm at, and then it kind of faded out in this all understandable uh, interaction was the neighbor. Mm -hmm. I guess you know what the country is, it's in their language. Is this to, is this to the fact that we're bringing back the Latin Mass, and will it be celebrated in our church as a regular Mass? I mean, yeah, no, that's a good question. Will the Mass, will the, the mass be celebrated regularly here? Um, that's a good, that's a question for Father Woodjo, but, <laughs> but I can say I know that the Mass is going to be celebrated in a few weeks, and so that's why uh, I'm here tonight to help prepare people to understand it, so that I think it's a very pastoral approach to uh, not necessarily drop everyone who's most interested in the deep end and letting you <laughs> figure it out on your own. Um, and there's places for that, sure. But um, so, yeah, to, to, I'm trying to, to, to help uh, guide in, in learning about, uh, about the, the Latin Mass. I would say that there is a growing appreciation for the traditions of the church. And the Latin Mass is growing in that regard, in that the Latin Mass is a full expression of the tradition, the liturgical tradition of the Church. And with Pope Benedict's uh, document on the Latin Mass, the Morum Pontificum, he called for it to be celebrated side by side with the Novus Ordo. And I feel, I think that that's what we're experiencing now. You know. Is it going to go beyond that? I don't know, I can't say. But there is a movement for sure of trying to implement Pope Benedict's vision of having the Latin Mass with the extraordinary form celebrated alongside the, the Novus Ordo, the ordinary form. Yeah. I watch EWTN's Mass, and mm -hmm. um, they have like a mixture where part of it's in Latin and part of it's in English. Is that a low Mass or a high Mass? Because it's not sung, it's a low Mass? It's a new Mass. But I'm really confused about that. Yes, no, that's a good that's a good question, and this is where it does get a little confusing. The distinctions of low and high mass are clearer in the extraordinary form in the traditional Latin mass. They're not as distinct or clear in the Novus Ordo, um, because 
the reason is, in the Latin Mass, if you're going to have a high Mass, everything has to be sung. If you're going to have a low Mass, you can't sing any of the liturgical parts. It's, those parts are all spoken, and you can have hymns. But if you're going to have a high Mass, everything has to be sung. What, say, happens on EWTN is what the Church allowed for in uh, the document in 1967 on the instruction of sacred music, allowing for certain parts to be sung, but it, it, you don't have to sing everything, kind of in, in stages, uh, as you were mentioning. We're singing some parts of the Mass now that we did it in uh, just low Masses, but we're not oftentimes singing the whole thing. Do you have a follow-up? Well, I don't know if this has to do with you. Probably father that dancing. Are we receiving communion in the old-fashioned way with the communion rail? At this type of mass, are we going to receive communion as they do today? So with the, the question is, are we receiving communion the way that they used to before um, the changes in the mass? So this is an important thing, and it's a little tricky because the when Pope Benedict um, encouraged the Latin Mass to be celebrated, he also said that the liturgical norms for the, the Latin Mass at the time it, uh, of 19, at the time of 1962 have to be followed in that celebration of the Mass. So in that sense, we have more options in celebrating the Novus Ordo Mass of whether we're going to do something in Latin or English, uh, like an EWT in some parts are Latin, some parts are in English. Some parts are spoken, some parts are not. There's different ways to receive communion. You can receive communion standing in the hand, or on the tongue, or kneeling in the Novus Ordo. However, the liturgical norms, the laws governing the Latin Mass, only allow for receiving it kneeling and on the tongue in the celebration of the Latin Mass. Any more questions? Yes? Can you speak of using the breath when singing? Latin, you know, to the the high and low notes and the the control of the breath. The control of the breath. So breath is really important in singing. (laughs) Bailey sings with me in choir, so he's laughing. (laughs) Um, Breath. It sounds poetic in this way, but it's it's more than just a, a, a something nice to say. Breath is where the life is, right? When the breath goes out of the person, they're gone, and the breath. And the musical phrase is the same thing. If we don't breathe for singing a musical phrase, it sounds dead, sounds flat. There's no life in the, the phrase. So when we're singing a phrase, it, say we have, to, we have to, our breath is slightly different than when we're singing it, than when we're speaking something. Oftentimes we have to breathe lower if we're gonna, uh, and we're using some more, say, abdominal muscles than we do when we're speaking. Um, and when we sing in different parts of our vocal register, we're using different muscles for that. So, um, so we, we do have to use our breath in a unique way for that. Um, and I can talk to you more about that later. But. Yes? Um, I just have a question. Um, you said that you were going to walk into the uh, particularly St. Dominic's people. Because I read fine print, I discovered that the beginning of the St. Michael's, I think it's St. I know it's Michael's uh, hymnal, Mm -hmm. you have, I believe it's called the ordinary of the Mass, in the Latin. And you can see the parts that would normally be sung at an extraordinary form and acquaint yourself with it. And it has the translation into the English on the right-hand side. And the, the music, everything we, we looked at today is in the St. Michael's hymnal as well um, that we have in the, in the pews. All of that music is in there, the, the, the chant for the, the Kyrie and the, hymn, the Marian hymns as well. Yeah. Well, very good. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to, to come up and talk to me at some point tonight, I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you. Peter Carter, ladies and gentlemen. A man could sit here and tell you about everything. Thank you, Peter. Anyway, it's a great joy to have Peter here this evening, and uh, thank you so much for coming out this evening for the first of our uh, trying uh, discussions and talks together. And uh, we're really going to have a lot of fun next week as well. Uh, the great speaker next week. I want you to come out and meet him uh, November 26th. <laughs>
you have any questions, you can ask him. <laughs> no, really, but Peter, uh, I think really what you've done is help us to really get an idea of how many different parts, moving parts that go into a liturgy that was born out of 2,000 years, written by theologians, saints, scholars, the angels, penning so much through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that's what we have. And all of what we have in the past is what we hold on to. It's how we know where we're going in the future. So next week we'll talk a little bit more about the, the ins and outs of the traditional Mass. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions as we move along next week. And of course the third in our series, uh, Mrs. Dorothy Conway, who will be here with us as well. And then of course December 9th will be that beautiful Mass that will give all glory and honor to the Blessed Virgin for the Immaculate Conception. Peter's here to answer all your questions. I know growing up in school, it's great to ask questions in the classroom. It's easier on the side. So he'll be here to talk to you one-on-one -on -one for a bit. Folks, thank you so much. Perhaps we can end this evening with a prayer in honor of she in whom we will come together on the 9th to honor. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us St. Dominic, pray for us. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Folks, thank you so much for coming out. I really hope to see you next week as well. God bless you. Thank you.